Welcome to The Theology of the Buddy, a podcast for Catholics who love the beauty of the Church's sacred tradition. This is episode 65. My name is Chris. If you're looking to grow in your faith in new ways, looking to connect with other faithful Catholics who are committed to helping you grow closer to our blessed Lord, or simply looking for other Catholic voices who are willing to speak the truth without compromise, and who like to have a little fun in the process, you've come to the right place. Uh, We're not experts, but we have learned a lot over the 15 plus years we've been friends in the faith, and we want to share that with you. So if you haven't yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to ensure you get the best Catholic candid conversations delivered to you every week. Don't forget to drop by theologyofthebuddy.com for all of our show notes and past episodes. And while you're at it, don't forget to follow us on social media so you can keep up to date with all the great content we are sending out. All right, so I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. He hails from Decatur, Illinois, and is a Catholic husband and father of three. He's been a successful university basketball coach for eight years, following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather, and is now the author of the book, Fill Your Cup for Christ, A Spiritual Journey Sown and Grown Through Sports. He has been featured on KSDK News, Catholic Radio, and is no stranger to the Catholic podcast sphere. Here to share a bit of his story and what sports can teach us about our own journey with Christ, Coach Kramer Soderberg. Welcome to the podcast. How's it going, Chris? Appreciate you having me. I'm oh. excited to be here. Oh, I'm glad that we were finally able to make this happen. So, absolutely, uh, yeah. So, so let's get into it. Um, tell us a little bit about your your story and how you came to love the faith. Yeah, yeah. I've um, I was I was raised as a cradle Catholic. Um, in a, you know, a a pretty devout Catholic home and uh, mom and dad did what, what all good Catholic parents do. They, you know, take us to mass on Sundays. And um, that was always a part of our, you know, our daily routine. Um, So it, it was one of those things. And I think for most cradle Catholics that you kind of get lost in the monotony of things. Um, You get lost in the, you know, the rules and what you're supposed to do and, and kind of following the the code of conduct almost. And uh, you know, it was, you know, for me kind of just a, a sleepwalk, you know, through most of my, all of my adolescence years and then my young adult years as well. Um, kind of um, in high school, I was just uh, being a Catholic because mom and dad told me to in college when mom and dad weren't there anymore. You know, you kind of fall away a little bit and stop going to mass and, and, and stop doing those things that, you know, were put upon me by my parents. Um, and then only later, kind of after college, uh, you know, you start to get married and, you know, thinking about having kids when you start to realize, okay, maybe, maybe I got to get, you know, serious about some, some important things. Um, and that's when I kind of started to come back to not necessarily the Catholic faith, but to Christ just himself. Um, and I read, you know, read some good books and, and kind of dove into my relationship with Jesus in a way that I never had before. Um, and then after cultivating that, that personal relationship with Christ and falling, falling in love with him, you know, for real, for the first time, then I, I started to ask my question, myself the question, okay, what is Jesus want me to do? You know, if I really love him the way I say I love him, then I'm going to try to do exactly what he wants of me. And that kind of be- began my, my search for, you know, search for the truth. And, um, I, you know, I, I mentioned this, you know, in my book kind of about my journey, but I got to, you know, gotten some spitting matches with my dad about, about the Catholic faith, you know, and almost went on the journey to, to prove him wrong a little bit, you know, cause he was stout in his faith and, you know, he, he would stand up for the, the teachings of the church and I would question him. And, um, so that, that kind of was my motivation to start with was to prove my dad wrong. <laughs> and then of course, as, as we all know, happens uh, for most people is that when you try to prove the Catholic church wrong, you end up getting proved wrong. So (laughs) that's what happened to me. That's awesome. That's awesome. So was there like a specific aha moment or was it just like kind of a, a slow burn kind of thing where it just kind of slowly grew for you? Yeah, it was, it was kind of a slow burn. It wasn't, it wasn't like a big moment where, you know, I got punched in the face or anything like that (laughs) at adoration by, by the spirit, you know, it was, it was kind of the, one of the main things that really bothered me, um, with, with what my dad would kind of defend is I, you know, we would argue different topics. And a lot of the times he would say, you know, Kramer, I don't know the answer to that question, but what I do know is, and, and he would always revert back to this verse. He, w- he would say, what I do know is Jesus told Peter, you are rock. 
and on this on on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti will not prevail against it. And and he said, um, since Peter, there's been a continual line of succession from Peter until now, and uh, because of that, because of what Christ said. The Catholic Church will be my church forever and always. And I don't know all the answers, but I know that the Catholic Church has the answers. And that it made sense to me, like that that argument, but it frustrated me at the same time. It was like, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, hone in, you know, on one Bible verse that that sums up the whole truth and just believe it because of that one verse. Mm -hmm. So I kind of because of that kind of just started studying every topic and okay i started with um you know why do we pray to mary and the saints not just to jesus and all these typical catholic um you know questions that people are going to have and as you dive into those as you read the church fathers as you you know go through the catechism everything starts to make sense and as you you know once you dive into something then you'll find another nugget that's interested in you and then you'll go down that rabbit hole and you'll be studying that for a while and it's just I started calling it my lifelong research project is what it is. It, it, I just continually keep learning more and more things and become more and more fascinated by the genius of the church. And it's just, um, it's just so fun for me. I've, I've really become almost obsessed with it a little bit, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a great joy, but it all stemmed from just my love of, of love of Christ and Christ Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? You know, and when you ask that question, you'll come to, well, Jesus wants you to come, you know, to mass. He wants you to unite yourself to him through the Eucharist. He wants you to go to confession. You know, all these things that he is asking you to do for the sake of your own spiritual growth. And then when you realize, man, these are things that he wants you to do, gifts he's given to you. Then you're like, man, I'm done. I'm, I'm there. I'm doing it. No matter how hard it is or difficult, I'm going to be there because I love Jesus and he wants me to do it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I totally agree. I, um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but you know, I've, I'm always been a very strong proponent of always attempting to introduce a person to the person of Christ before you start getting into the, yeah. the nitty gritty of, of Absolutely. what the church teaches, you know, because if you, if you don't have that love relationship with Christ, it's hard to really pursue a life of virtue. Do like, do you agree with correct. that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I truly, I think that's, that's correct in, in any, any realm of, of the world, whether it's sports or business or whatever, you know, if you, if you aren't truly in love with whatever you're pursuing at some point, difficulties, struggles, trials are going to arise that will make you want to stop, you know, you know, just as, you know, everybody says, you know, who's pursuing athletics, everybody says they want to be the best athlete they can be. But unless you truly love the game, you're going to fall off at some point because things are going to get hard. Um, same with, you know, the business world. If you, if you don't truly love the, the, the world that you're in the you know, the business that you're going after, you'll, you'll fall away. Um, and it's, uh, that, that's where it all stems from is, is love of whatever you're doing. And then of course, in the spiritual realm, love of Christ, that will make you want to keep going in those struggles. Um, so that's, that's what happened to me. And it was, it was just a, a passion for Christ, a love for Christ that it continually drives me to keep going now. Awesome. So, uh, we talked kind of in the intro, uh, that your, your father and your grandfather were both heavenly involved in, in coaching sports. Yep. Did their love for the game inspire that love of the game for you? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, my grandpa was a high school coach, you know, you know, through for a long, long time, high school and fo um, high school basketball and football. Um, my dad has been a college basketball coach for my entire life. And I always tell people this, if you're a coach's kid, you're either going to fall in love with the game or hate the game. There, there's really no in between because you, you just get <laughs> enveloped in it uh, at a young age. But I happen to fall in love with, you know, the game of basketball, you know, sitting, sitting on the side as a two year old, just what, you know, you just, you just start taking things in and you, you fall in love with it. So the passion for the game of basketball started at a young age. And again, my love of the game helped me keep driving and, and, you know, become a, you know, a, a good basketball player, have the opportunity to play division one college basketball. And again, it, it keeps my love of the game keeps driving me in my career in my coaching career. Um, so yeah, it started early on for me just being a coach's kid and, 
Um, his, his, my dad's influence has been profound on me, but he's been at many, many places throughout his career. I've kind of been a military brat almost. And, um, he's currently at the university of Virginia, uh, as an assistant coach there. So it's been, it's been a fun journey for us as a family. And, um, but as a coach's kid, you go through some ups and downs. There's some great <laughs> things about it, but then there's also some challenges. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Now in terms of your career, you know, you're now uh, a university uh, basketball coach yourself. How how does your faith impact that career and and your involvement as a coach? Yeah, great question. Um, th- there's there's an aspect to it that you know at at a university and and the university I'm at isn't affiliated by any means with anything. So um, I'm I'm he- you know I'm involved with our Newman Center on campus, which has been great. Um, but in regards to like um, you know talking to our players, it, it's not like I openly speak of Jesus all the time and, and pound it down their throat. Um, but what I've learned to do is you know, and I think what most people learn to do is you you live out your faith through your actions and i hope that on a on a daily basis my players can see you know the joy and the excitement and the love and, and all those those virtues that we talked about and say man there's something about coach that that is intriguing you know why is he like that and i hope that kind of my um you know, just the way that I act, the way that I present myself, the way that I am on a daily basis inspires them to come to me and dive more into the faith side of things. And, um, I, I get kids in my office often, you know, and as you build relationships, they, they are willing to open up more and more and they start to ask questions. And I've had beautiful, uh, spiritual conversations with kids that have led them to growing. And, um, but I think spiritually how it's, how my faith has helped me in, in the basketball world in my profession is that I think I used to think of um, my profession in my spiritual life as two separate things. You know, I, I go to church and then I go to, I go to work and, and those are two separate things. But as I grew spiritually and matured in my understanding of, of what it meant to be a Christian and as a Catholic, those two things kind of came together and, and there's, there's no separation of that. Um, and the idea of trying to constantly be aware of Christ in my life, trying to constantly be aware of, of his involvement in what I'm doing and glorify him through every aspect of my life. It, it went, glorify him when I'm at mass, but also when I go to work, when I'm coaching, um, when I'm a husband and a father at home, you know, that when you can meld your entire life into one glorifying act to the Lord, that's when you got something good. Um, but I think before that it was, I go to mass, I kind of say my piece to him and then forget and I go do my thing and I'll come back the next Sunday. Right. Right. There's, I think it was, yeah, it was John Paul the second, right. Who's feast day in the Novus Ordo is today. Oh, yeah. Um, and in Krista Videlis Lecce, he talks about the separation of faith and life, you know, and how as Catholics, we need to have that integrated, spirituality where, mm-hmm. where it informs both. Um, like in your, in your case, obviously the, the faith has informed your, your career, but how has actually working in sports and the lessons you've learned from sports impacted your own faith? Oh man. You know, it's sport. I, I always say sports transcends all walks of life, but, um, man, especially the spiritual aspect. And you see it often. I mean, in St. Paul's writings, he's often referring to, you know, kind of the athlete and that pursuing of that goal. And not up until I I started diving into the Catholic faith, I I didn't, I wasn't able to kind of combine the two mentalities. Um, But finally, when I started diving into things, the, the combination of how I pursue my sport in, in that my mentality as an athlete is you, you are just striving to become the best every day. You know, like when I was still a player, you're, you're, you're thinking about being the best athlete you can be pursuing championships and you you will do whatever you have to do to, to get there. You know, you'll put your body through conditioning and, and weights and, and struggles, and you'll go through these challenges to as you're pursuing that goal. And until I connected the two, it was hard for me to understand the church and all the, the hard stuff 
that they were trying to make me do, you know, like, <laughs> why do I have to say the rosary or do extra stuff? Why, why go to daily mass or why go to adoration, all these different things. But then when I started to understand, like, no, 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 it makes sense as, as an athlete, if I'm pursuing something great, really challenging, it's going to be hard. That, that just make everybody knows that that makes sense. So when I finally connected that with, no, if I'm, if I'm pursuing something great and the greatest thing, which is heaven, it, it's going to be a challenge. There, there's going to be some things that I have to do that are going to be difficult. There is going to be some things I have to give up that I may not want to give up. And when I finally connected those two, it, it just made sense to me that clicked. And as a basketball player, I was willing to give up, you know, the, the drinking and, you know, the stuff that I knew would hurt my pursuit of my goal. And I was willing to do the extra stuff, do the extra running and the extra shots in the gym. Um, and then when I finally connected that, well, okay, that makes sense. I, I'm going to have to give up some stuff if I want to pursue heaven and become a, uh, become a saint. You know, I'm going to have to add some extra stuff. I'm going to have to do some extra spiritual weightlifting every so often to, to, to become that saint I want to be. So that when, when those two things came together, it was like, aha, okay, that makes sense. And then the, the challenging things, the difficult things that the Catholic church was presenting to me didn't become, you know, they weren't stupid or dumb or didn't make sense anymore. They completely made sense. You know, it just, it just all clicked in, in that kind of sports analogy for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, when I was a, I used to work in, in Catholic youth ministry a number of years ago. And I remember having a conversation with one of the guys, uh, that, that I was serving back then. And I remember having a conversation about how they just didn't feel like that the Catholic church was like manly enough. And I was like, you know, I, at that time I remember, looking at the majority of the kids in the youth group, which were girls and the, yeah. you know, the number of people in the pews, which were women. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, I understand this, you know, like, cause growing up in the church, I never once heard the word virtue preached from the pulpit. Never once did I hear that until my yeah. adult years. And, and really not until I started digging into uh, more traditional Catholicism. And then I was like, wow, like this is, this is manly stuff, you know? And, yeah. um, I, f I feel like we do a disservice when we don't, especially for men, show them this high standard oh, that, yes. that the faith has for them. Absolutely. And it's, and you're so right on. And, and I think that you, you see this watered down Christianity coming in and, you know, people go to the, you know, the places because of the lights and the musics and things become easy. But my goodness, I don't, I don't think people really want that. People want to be challenged. Um, I, in, in my book, I give an example of if, if you were, if you were trying to train to become a gold medalist, if you were trying to be an Olympian and you had to select your choice of trainer, the, the guy who was going to train you to be an Olympian, and you had three choices and the first trainer told you, hey, this, you know, it, it's going to be, it's not going to be too difficult. We're going to work out, you know, three days a week. Um, you know, it won't, you won't have to change much your lifestyle. It'll be pretty fun and easy for you. And then the second guy said, well, this is going to be a little more difficult. We're going to work out probably five days a week. I'm going to challenge you, you know, some of the times it's going to be hard, but you'll be able to get through it, you know, decently easy. And then the third guy says, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. You're going to have to, you have going to change your lifestyle. I'm going to push you so hard that you're going to want to quit. Sometimes we're going to work out every day for the next three years until the Olympics arrive. But I promise you, I've trained Olympians in the past and I've, I've trained gold medalists. And if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to be a gold medalist. Now, if you ask any person on earth, which trainer they're going to choose, unless they're a spineless sissy, they're <laughs> going to choose trainer number three. And yeah. especially for us men, like when you hear trainer number three, you're like, yeah, let's go, man. I'm ready. Um, and that's the Catholic church. The yeah. Catholic church is trainer number three. Yeah. And all these other churches that are watered down, they're trainer number one and number two. And if as Olympians, we heard the three trainers, everybody's going to say, well, yeah, I'm going with trainer number three because he's going to push my limits. But unfortunately, we don't choose a lot of times people don't choose that trainer when it comes to 
the religion side of things. They choose the one that's watered down, that doesn't push them, that's easiest. Um, so I think for men, just like you said, man, we would latch on to something like that if we would just speak the truth about the Catholic Church isn't easy. It, it's it's not always fun. It, it's a grind sometimes, but boy, it's going to get you there. Yeah, no, exactly. And that that for me was part of my reasoning for growing closer to the traditional side of the Catholic faith, because, you know, like I had grown up in the charismatic renewal and while it had done a lot of fantastic things for me and had introduced me to having that personal relationship with Christ and beginning yeah. a life of prayer and, you know, the sacramental life and all of that. Um, it was these traditional Catholic saints who are telling me to get myself together and be a man you know, yeah. not the, not the just, you know, God wants you to feel good kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's not that therapeutic deism that is mm. so prevalent in so many parishes. Um, but it was the real deal stuff that called me on to, to seek holiness. I was like, yeah, this is it. You know, this is what I can sink my teeth into. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, and again, it's the same as, it's the same as when you hear stories, you know, about like the, the, the best athletes. Like when you hear stories about Kobe Bryant's work ethic, like what he did a, as an athlete, you're like, Oh my gosh, that's incredible. And it inspires you to pursue that kind of greatness. Um, same thing spiritually. And that's the beauty of the, the saints that we have. It's like when I started learning about Padre Pio and, you know, I'm struggling to try to get one rosary in a day. And I hear that this <laughs> dude is busting out 30 to 50 a day. I'm like, are you kidding? You know, that type of stuff is just so spiritually motivating. Um, yeah. And it, it's awesome stuff, man. And when, when our, when our, when the, when our men, especially, kind of grasp on to that type of mentality of, of not settling for mediocrity, but just chasing down greatness that that's when we're going to set the world on fire. No, for sure. For sure. Now maybe, maybe switching gears a little bit, you know, we talked about you being a dad, you know, of, of three, three kids under six, you said three kids under six. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the road to sainthood right there. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that there's probably some, some lessons that you could maybe apply to the vocation of marriage that you've gleaned through your coaching career. Does anything yeah. kind of stick out in your mind as, you know, things that you've learned there that you've applied in your, in your own marriage? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, we, when we were, um, when I was a player, we had we had a, a, a f what we called our five pillars. Um, my dad was actually my college coach for two of my years, um, and he had five pillars to our program. And if you know anything about Virginia's program, they have the same five pillars. It's um, humility, passion, unity, servanthood, and thankfulness. Th those five pillars are what my my dad kind of built our program around when I was in college. That's what Virginia's built their program around. And those five pillars have, have really pushed me, um, you know, in that idea of virtue and boy, does it, but does it ever help you in the, you know, in the world of being a husband and being a father? And I'd say one that really sticks out in that respect is, is servanthood, you know, in, it's that ability to, wash the feet of others, you know, to, to put the, the, um, the, the worries and concerns of others at the center of all your decisions, you know, and that's, that's what marriage is. That's what, you know, being a father is, is completely forgetting yourself and, and handing it over to the other, um, you know, and that's, that's been, that's been really special for me to, take those things as you know that i learned as a player and use as a coach and then apply it to your marriage and um and being a dad and but then there's there's also you know a great aspect to being a father is your kids teach you a heck of a lot you know almost sometimes more than you teach them you know it's um one thing that really sticks out to me is you know, as a dad, you, you, sometimes you get mad at your kids. They, they keep doing the same thing, you know, over and over and you just lose your time. I've told you 20 times, stop doing that, you know, and you just lose your temper. And then I, and then, you know, I go to, conf I try to go to confession, you know, every other week or so. And you realize sitting in confession that 
you always come back to Christ saying the same sin over and over. And you, you look at yourself like, how am I going to get mad at my little boys or my little girl for doing the same thing over and over when I keep going to Christ with the same sin over and over? And when you look at fatherhood, the way our, you know, beloved father, you know, acts it out, that that is that is telling. And, and you can learn, man, you can learn so much from your kids, from their joy to their forgiveness, to their awe, to their um, love of others, to their ability to forget things quickly. You know, I'll be so amazed with my boys. They will get in a scruff and they will fight and they'll claw and they'll hate each other in that moment. But two seconds later, they're best friends again. And as adults, we can't do that. <laughs> we'll, we'll argue with somebody and then we'll hold a grudge for a week and a half. So the, the beauty of kids is, you know, and that's, you know, when Christ says we have to be childlike, there's so much to take from, from our children. Yeah. They teach me a lot more than I teach them. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like St. Therese, right. With her, her doctrine on spiritual childhood. I mean, that just, that yeah. just sums it up, right? Like a little flower. She's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So kind of maybe to, to kind of cap off our, our conversation. So right now, obviously there's a lot of doom and gloom in the world. There's a lot of doom and gloom in the church, especially with the recent confusing stuff that's come out of Rome. And yep. so I don't know if you've been seeing this, but like on my social media, I've seen people saying that they're done. They're just thrown in the towel. Uh, some are saying they're, they're going to go just join another church or, or ecclesial community, if you will. Even some of the seemingly strongest and faithful people have been really impacted um, by what's going on right now with the confusion coming out of Rome. As a coach, how do you encourage the men on your team to seek excellence and carry on when they're discouraged and how would you apply that to us as Catholics? Oh man, that, that is, that is a deep one. Um, I'll, I'll tell as a coach, I often lean on stories for my players, you know, um, kind of si similar to Christ leaned on parables, you know, things, things that help give people images. Um, and I'm going to lean on the, the story that has, basically shaped my entire life and ironically the story that shaped my book um my book is called fill your cup for christ and what it is derived from is a story that my father told me and probably 200 other basketball campers when i was in sixth grade um so at a basketball camp when i was in sixth grade he sat us all down and he was um, going to give us a little talk and I was annoyed by this because I didn't want to listen to my dad talk. I wanted to play. Um, but he, he said, I'm going to introduce you guys to three cups or three, three players. Okay. These players ended up being cups and he pulled out of his backpack, a big cup that was probably like 64 ounces, a uh, medium sized cup, no, kind of normal drinking glass size. And then like a little Dixie cup. And he basically said that, each of these cups represent the potential of each player. Okay. And he said, I don't care if you're the big cup, the medium cup or the small cup. I don't care if you're six, seven or five eleven. All I care about is how much water you put in your cup. All I care about is how much you get out of your potential. And that, that spoke to me in a, a profound way that day. And on the drive home, my dad said, Kramer, just so you know, you're the small cup. Um, <laughs> because he, yeah, because he knew, he knew due to my gene pool, I wasn't going to be taller than six foot. I wasn't very athletic. I wasn't very strong, but he knew that I wanted to be a division one college basketball player and how difficult that was going to be. And he said, success success isn't defined by what you achieve or how many trophies you win or how many awards you get. Success is defined by getting the most out of your potential. And that drove me as an athlete for a long, long time. Only later did I realize how relevant that is to my spiritual life, how relevant that is to me for as a father, me as a husband, um, in filling my cup to the top for Christ's sake every day. And how that relates to today is I think we can get so lost in what's 
what's happening around us that we lose track of what our duty is. And our duty is to get the most out of what God is Christ's sake to, to just dive into no matter if Christ gave you a huge platform, you know, whether you have a, a podcast that a million people hear or that only two people hear, whether you're a, a you know, a, a Catholic speaker on EWTN or whether you're a janitor, irrelevant, irrelevant, the size of your cup. All that matters is how much potential you get out of that cup, how much effort you put into becoming the best that you can be for Christ's sake. And I think when you focus on those things, when you, when you focus on just giving your all each day for his sake, then everything else that's going on around you can can kind of brush off you like dust in the wind. It's, it's not going to affect that focus because you know what you can control and you know what success really is. Success isn't based on winning or losing. Success isn't based on, um, you know, getting this many viewers or this many likes. It success is based on becoming the best that you can be. Um, and at, at the end of the day, it's, you know, if I, I believe if you can stand in front of Christ and say, Lord, I filled my cup to the top for you. He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come share in your master's joy. Amen. Yeah, so true. So true. Is there, are there any saints that come to mind that, I know you mentioned Padre Pio. Are there any other saints that really inspire you to really fill that cup in your life? Yeah, St. Padre Pio was one who kind of um, really you know, made me say, man, this guy is doing a lot more than I'm doing. Um, but yeah, a few others come to mind. One was, um, St. Jose Maria Escriva, um, you know, founder of Opus Dei. He, he gave me something in that, like kind of that co- combining the spiritual life and your work life. It, it's not two separate things. You, you can, no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing the dishes or whether I'm coaching, all that can be given to Christ, all that can glorify Christ. So that he was kind of someone who, who really helped me in that regard. And then one of my other favorite saints that I cling to is um, St. Joseph and um, Saint foster father of Jesus, St. Joseph. And for, for me, it's, it's something that I want to be that, that I'm not yet. Um, I, as an athlete, I always, and still one of my vices is, you know, I crave to be on the court. I crave to be under the lights. I, I like the pressure of people watching me. And I think that for me is a, one of those things that I have to learn to subdue in, in humility. I have to put aside my ego, put aside my pride and um, glorify the Lord instead of glorifying myself. And what I love about St. Joseph is how humble he is. Not one word in the gospel is from St. Joseph. You know, he just did his duty to protect Mary, to protect Jesus, to raise Jesus uh, as long as he was on earth. Just he he inspires me that way to just be a quiet, steady voice, a steady companion for my wife, for my kids and take upon that humility, let go of that desire for, um, you know, self-centeredness, for attention, for honor, and and just do my duty for the Lord. Um, and so those two probably stick out to me on top of my, my Padre Pio uh, yeah. friend as well. Yeah. So. I, uh, you know, you were talking about the hiddenness of St. Joseph. I've been thinking about that a lot lately and thinking in particular, again, back to St. Therese, you know, when she died, the, the sisters said about her there was nothing special about her they yeah. they they had no idea okay. how much of a uh spiritual powerhouse was in that monastery with them and you know and and Therese didn't want to be known as you know as <laughs> the saint she was i mean she told god that she wanted to be a saint and she she made right. that clear in her writings but nobody else really knew how hard yeah. she was going for it so i mean it's yeah that virtue of being hidden is uh yeah especially right now there's that there's especially the spirit of narcissism especially you know like instagram and social media yeah. like it's everywhere right yeah. and so you know 
committing to being hidden and and having those good works only seen by God is uh, mm. is a real thing to strive for for sure. Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 such a for, like I mentioned for me such a challenge to kind of fight off those temptations. But um, Saint Joseph, that that quiet father and husband, is showing me the way. I'm trying to trying to be him. That's right. Yeah. Have you, uh, did you do the consecration to St. Joseph yet from, uh, Father Calloway? I have, I have not done the consecration to St. Joseph. I just recently consecrated. I got my brown scapular here. Nice. And what's so funny about Joseph being <laughs> hidden is I have, I have my St. Joseph medal <laughs> hidden in my brown scapular. So just perfect little analogy there for you. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. No, um, if if you get a chance to do that consecration, it's fantastic. It's uh, it-, it opened my mind and my my heart to Saint Joseph in a way that I hadn't been open to him before, and awesome. by the end of it, I was like, "This is my guy," you know, like this is yeah. this is the guy I got to go to. And um, like Saint Teresa of Avila, she she absolutely was obsessed with Saint Joseph. Anything she need. Mm-hmm she needed, but she'd go to him. So, you know, I want to, I want to learn to be like her and, and, and do that myself. So yeah. Isn't that, it's, so just, it's so awesome. And that's another thing that as I, I keep diving into the Catholic faith, there's just, there's so many, there's so many routes you can take what, whatever it, it's so there's such an individualistic side to it that people don't realize. Like they're like, well, you guys all have to do the same thing and you're structured, but, but no, there, there's just so many ways you can go. You can, you can find devotions and different things. If, you know, if you are a, you know, a charismatic prayer, you can be that. If you need a little bit more structure, you can do that. It's just so much good stuff in the Catholic church that when you really dive in, it just opens up and broadens and, and you're, you almost, your mind wants to explode with how much, amazingness is in there and it's it's really fun it's yeah. it's been a joy to to dive into for sure yeah the uh the scripture where our lord talks about his yoke being easy and his burden light i didn't yeah. really understand that but i yeah. guess like in the jewish context each yoke like it was like the wood that would go around the That's uh two, right yeah and and but it would be formed to you like so that you could properly carry it you know, uh-huh. um, so everybody's yoke was different. So yeah, like yeah, the, the Lord has, has, a, a particular route for us to, to get to him and to get to heaven. So, um, yeah, all within so the amazing. context of being Catholic. So it's beautiful. So amazing. It's awesome, man. It awesome. is awesome. Great. Well, can you, can you tell us where our, our friends can find you online? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you can find me Instagram is, is a good place. I, my, my, little tagline there is a Catholic coach, a, a Catholic coach is my, um, my username there. And you can also go to my website, www.kramersoderberg.com. Uh, you can pick up my book there. Uh, it's also available on Amazon and, um, yeah, I self published it. So I'm, I'm trying to spread the word any way I can. And I hope one person reads it and is affected by it and passes it to the next. And by God's grace, I hope to, um, inspire a lot of people to be saints. Wonderful. Wonderful, dude. Well, well, we'll ensure that, uh, your, um, your website and the Amazon link are all in our show notes, uh, for anybody who's interested in picking up the book and, and checking out more of your work. And, uh, again, Kramer, it has been an absolute joy having you on today's podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate you having me. All right. Another podcast on the books and I absolutely loved this conversation with Coach Kramer Soderberg. What did you think? I'd love to know. Hit us up on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram at Theology of the Buddy. You can email me at theologyofthebuddy at gmail.com. I'd love to know your thoughts. Make sure you visit our show notes at uh, theologyofthebuddy.com where you can find all the links for Kramer's book and uh, and his website as well as all of our past episodes and show notes so anyways I want to thank everyone for listening today I really appreciate you hanging out with us and uh, next week we are getting back into our Know Thyself series where we are diving into what it means to grow in true Catholic self-knowledge 
to be able to grow in our life of virtue. So please, we'd love for you to come back next week and listen in to the Theology of the Buddy podcast. And until then, stay tratty. <laughs>